I want to reach out to this technology. I want to incorporate this technology into, into my art and, and have the two mixed together. We were making a lot of decisions where we thought things were going to be because we didn't have the compute power to support at the time what we wanted to do. So at lunch one day, a Bell Labs executive asked, what would it take to ray trace this scene in real time? And I said, well, we need a 512 by 512 array of Cray supercomputers, each with a red, green, and blue light bulb on top, and we'll put it in the desert and fly over to 10,000 feet and take pictures of it. I recall it being sort of 10 or 12 months of hell getting these shots done, and it was because the render times were so horrendously long. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NVIDIA founder and CEO, Jensen Huang. Welcome. We've been working really hard for 10 years. The engineers at NVIDIA, NVIDIA Research, all over the world, our partners, software developers, engine makers in the industry, we've all been working so hard. And today is a historic moment. We have something very special to share with you, something we think is very important. So let's get started. Today's a special day because this SIGGRAPH is Pixar RenderMan's 30th birthday. Guys. That's worth a celebration. Ed Catmull and the amazing engineers and researchers at Pixar started a full feature animation, computer generated animation revolution. The work that they have done is absolutely remarkable. Over the course, over the course of last 20, 30, 20, is it 20, 30 years, 30 years, the progress that they have made and the relentless pursuit for image perfection has been nothing short 
of amazing. 1995, Toy Story premiered using nerves to generate characters, stochastic sampled AAs, motion blur, the imagery were just beautiful. It was processed with 800,000 CPU hours, 800,000 CPU hours on a 100 megahertz, 27 megaflop Spark CPU. 100 megahertz, it's so cute. <laughs> 100 megahertz, 800,000 CPU hours. Several years later, with cars, they introduced real-time ray tracing, or ray tracing, so that they got beautiful reflections, beautiful shadows, ambient occlusion. In 2006, they used global illumination for the very first time, so that they don't have to paint their movies with hundreds of cameras inside the shots faking light. With global illumination, all of a sudden, Light just works as it should. The subtleties of light bouncing all over the environment, picking up the color as it goes along, paints it just an amazing, amazing movie. They saved so much time for their artists as they no longer have to sit there and rig up each one of the sets, virtual sets, with all these cameras. They took it another step further with Finding Dory in 2014. All of a sudden, Dory's in a water environment. The rays are bouncing off of the waves in the water. The reflection, the refractions, just exploded the amount of computation that was absolutely necessary to render that scene. And they invented something else. Using a state-of-the-art technology and deep learning, they created AI-based denoising. As a result, filling in all of the spots that the rays haven't reached yet and as a result, reduced the amount of render time necessary tremendously. But even then, even then, the amount of computation that was required is amazing. I think it was Big Hero 6, 200 million CPU core hours. Each one of the CPU cores are now 2 gigahertz. Compared to what was used in 1995, 30 years ago, 800,000 CPU core hours of 100 megahertz is now two, 2 gigahertz, 20 times, and then another 200 times, 4,000 times increase in the amount of CPU core hours needed. 4,000 times. Well, you know, Blin, Blin, Jim Blin, I think he might actually be in the audience. There are so many luminaries in the audience today, guys. There are so many pioneers in computer graphics in the audience. I wish I had seen the attendees list. I would, have, I would have called you out. But it's so great that you guys are here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Henry Fuchs. I think Ivan Sutherland might be in the audience. Just so many, so many pioneers. <laughs> Ivan, that's terrific. Because of your pioneering work, we're standing on your shoulders and we created this industry together. Thank you very much. We're so grateful. So 4,000 times more computation le later. And Jim Blinn had this, had this law that said, basically, um, independent of how much com computing you provide the artist, they will always render up to several hours. Whatever the hours that they were willing to tolerate, they would render just as much compute, rendering as much using that computing, new computing resource as they were given before. And as a result, consume all of the computational capability that we provide. In fact, what's surprising is this. Now, of course, you guys know that for the last several years, Moore's law has really come to an end. We can't get transistors to go any faster without consuming even more power. We've lost the ability to find any more instruction level parallelism. We're running into walls left and right. As a result, CPU performance has really come to a, a halt, and you could see it here. But yet, the amount of computation, the amount of CPU, hours that's consumed to render these movies continue to go up. I believe there's actually a new law. The law is simply Jim Blinn's law. In addition, there's got to be an artist law of some kind. Pursuit of generating that perfect image, no matter 
what technology provides because that's simply what you demand. Meanwhile, 25 years ago this year, we started NVIDIA, and our pursuit was to generate the most amazing imagery in a 30th of a second. Instead of generating the most amazing image within a production time and a production budget, we had to generate the most amazing, amazing image within a 30th of a second and at the price point that consumers would pay for. That curve looks like this. Our first contribution was the introduction of GeForce 256, the first GeForce, the first processor that did all of the geometry transformation, lighting transformation in hardware. And then several years later, in 2000, in, um, 2006, I think it was. Was it 2006, 2003? We introduced GeForce 3, the world's first programmable shader. And then in 2006, we introduced our single most important GPU ever, the world's first compute GPU, the first CUDA GPU. The rate of progress has been completely astounding. And the reason for that is this. We've been able to operate and optimize performance across the entire stack. By working with APIs and engines and software developers, we've been able to remove bottlenecks and innovate and create new ideas that makes it possible for us to break Moore's law. And that's the reason why the accelerated computing law, the GPU accelerated computing law, has moved so much faster. But it requires us to all work as one team. This is the world's most demanding co-design challenge, where software developers, algorithm developers, tools developers are all working together to create one amazing experience. And you can see our track record. Completely unbelievable. That horsepower and that performance has been put to great use. We've been pursuing the path to photo real, and there are so much progress. Amazing amounts of geometry, that is going to be in the scene because the world's got lots of geometry and some of it includes light and cast shadows and the microstructure on the geometry allows us to pick up the subtleties of the light, causes that nice rim lighting. Using cameras with lots and lots of shots to reconstruct a photorealistic environment to model and to create photorealistic textures. Creating materials that are physically based metallic or dielectric, smooth or coarse, rough, because of the microstructures that you can barely see or you can't see at all. Translucency, subsurface scattering. All of these physically based properties are now possible for us to be modeled. Simulating physics, soft bodies, rigid bodies, particles, fluids, springs and strings because the world moves in a very predictable way, in ways that either are very natural to us or unbelievable to us. Character animation, using motion capture, and then blending shapes. And now we're even able to teach a character with deep learning how to animate itself. Facial animation is incredibly important. This is Digital Doug. Doug Robo, I think, is in, in the audience an Academy Award winner. This is him. He'll always be digital Doug to us. Doug, where are you? Just say hi. So that's digital Doug. Hi there. You're going to be famous. <clears throat> Very attractive guy. And it, instead of using markers on your face to figure out your, to track your, your uh, your facial animation, now we could use AI to figure that out all by itself. And so making it easier for us to capture very realistic facial animation. All of this progress is made possible because the performance of our capabilities, the technology underneath continues to advance. And working closely as one industry, we've been able to do amazing things. But there's been one enormous roadblock that roadblock is as fundamental as it is, as it can possibly be, 
as the simulation of light. We've been able to do all kinds of amazing things and make these amazing, beautiful vi video games, but we've been doing it through a lot of hackery. There are light probes and reflection probes that are made out of cube environment maps. We've been placing lights that are invisible to you in the environments so that we could recreate what otherwise would be global illumination. This roadblock has been the endeavor of computer scientists and computer graphics engineers since Turner Wittet first wrote about it in 1979. Turner Wittet is now a researcher at NVIDIA, and he, he described a really elegant architecture, a really alg elegant algorithm called the multi-bounce recursive ray tracing algorithm. It casts a ray from your virtual eye through a virtual screen through that pixel. And it flies towards and inter either intersects a surface. When it intersects that surface, it creates a whole bunch of shadow rays in the direction of lights. And if the path of that shadow ray towards the light were to be occluded, meaning it intercepts another, intersects another surface, it would be in shadow. Otherwise, it would be lit. But it goes further. If that surface was not diffused and it was reflective, it would generate a reflection ray. It would take into consideration the normal of that surface and the incoming angle of the ray. And then again, it would create that ray and it would follow the original algorithm. Create other shadow rays, trace its way to the light. And if it turns out to be a refractive surface, it would obey Snell's law, and it would bend according to the medium, and generate more rays, and then follow the original algorithm, hits another surface. If it, if it intersects another surface, creates a whole bunch more shadow rays. And then when it's all done with that, it would figure out how to illuminate that surface by shading it. Well, it turns out this algorithm, as elegant as it is, is incredibly computationally intensive. And the reason for that is because there are billions of rays and there are millions and millions of polygons in the scene. And so computing it is extraordinary. Well, at the time that he wrote the paper, he used the VAX, which is a mini, mini computer. At the time, it was probably a million and a half dollars. And it took him one and a half hours to simulate one frame. So he was basically doing, he was basically doing about 60 pixels per second. 60 pixels per second. These days we do 60 frames per second, but he does 60 pixels per second. That's also incredibly cute. <laughs> 60 pixels per second. And so that's so 60 pixels per second, he described that it would take a Cray computer behind every single pixel a Cray computer behind every single pixel to generate real-time ray tracing. It turns out his estimates were pretty close. It turns out his estimates were pretty close. 35 years later, we're able to put a Cray supercomputer behind every pixel. In fact, we're able to put several Cray, effectively several Cray supercomputers behind every single pixel. And we created a brand new way of doing rendering, and we introduced it this year at GDC, the Game Developers Conference in March, for the very first time. It's a brand new rendering system. We call it the NVIDIA RTX. And it runs on a desk-side supercomputer we call the DGX Station. It requires four of our highest performance GPUs, the same GPUs that are now powering our nation's fastest supercomputer, the fastest supercomputer in the world, called the Tesla V100. It takes four of those, all connected together, working simultaneously, generating five rays per pixel to simulate what you're about to see in real time. The engineers and the artists working together from Industrial Light and Magic, Epic, Tim Sweeney's company, and NVIDIA worked together on creating this first time fully ray traced amazing footage. This is all completely done in real time. Let's roll it. What's the story with all the other? 
elevators lately. I heard Kylo Ren destroyed the one over in D Sector. If you ask me, who's ever in charge of this place should be transferred to Hoth. <laughs> what? What? She heard us? Yeah, I think she heard us. At least we blend in for once. <gasps> Isn't that amazing, guys? <clears throat> running on a supercomputer, running on a supercomputer, generating five rays per pixel, it was able to do reflections, inner reflections, area lights, dynamic area lights, and all the wonderful soft shadows that you saw. Unbelievable achievement. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have a surprise for you. It turns out that what you just saw is a little faster than what we did. Give me a second. This is this is an intricate process, and I'll show you why in just a second. It turns out it was running on this. Just one single. One single GPU. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the world's first ray tracing GPU. What do you think about the design? Now, the concentration in my face is because the reflections on this <laughs> graphics card works perfectly. <laughs> it obeys the laws of physics. Tell me that's not beautiful. It obeys the... <laughs> If you were to create the world's first ray tracing GPU, why wouldn't it look like this? <laughs> You're asking, how does he do that? As it turns out, the force. <laughs> is that beautiful? This is the world's first ray tracing GPU. We call it the Quadro RTX family. There are several versions of it. The performance is absolutely incredible. Up to 10 giga rays per second. 10 giga rays per second. Just to put it in perspective, the fastest CPU on, in the world with a whole bunch of cores in it can probably do a few hundred thousand, a couple of two, three hundred thousand rays per second. 10 giga rays per second. 10 giga rays per second. It's even fun to say. <laughs> when was the first time that anybody ever used the word giga rays? We used teraflops, but we've never used the word giga rays. This is the world's first giga ray GPU. <laughs> How many rays you got, giga rays? <laughs> these, are, these are new. What did you see at SIGGRAPH? 10 giga rays. We saw 10 giga rays, 10 giga rays at SIGGRAPH. Not only does it have an enormous amount of floating point performance for shading, also this shader, this shading architecture, this SM, our new compute architecture, has the first independent instruction, in, integer and floating point processing pipeline so that we could do address calculations and 
numerical calculations all at the same time. We perform up to 16 teraflops, and when was the last time you heard the word tips? 16 tips. These are all brand new. These are, <laughs> these are brand new things that no computer scientist has ever said. How many tips do you have? 16 tips. How many giga rays can you do? 10 giga rays. I'm still messing with the camera. <laughs> Look at that, on command. This graphics card and light works exactly as I expected. No light probes, no faking. Look, there you go. We do this all day long. Okay, ouch. Here we go, thanks Paul. That's very beautiful. And it comes with this, this brand new NVLink multi-GPU connector so that the frame buffer, every single GPU, the GPU could talk to every other GPU's frame buffer as of its own. Over this NVLink interface, 100 gigabytes, low latency, this incredible NVLink connector here. Stop messing around, let's get back to work. All right, okay, so, 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 so the highest end Quadro, also powered by this Turing GPU, has 500 trillion tensor operations per, per second. 500 trillion tensor operations per second. No processor in the history of processors has ever commanded this much computational resource on one chip. I'm going to show it to you in just a second. It's absolutely amazing. 500 trillion tensor operations per second. Three types of processors. The SM for compute and shading. A brand new processor called the RT core with 10 giga rays per second for ray tracing. And a new processor called the tensor core for deep learning and AI. 500 trillion operations per second. The new Turing GPU, the new Turing GPU is the greatest leap since 2006 when we introduced CUDA. This fundamentally changes how computer graphics is going to be done. It's a step function in realism. These are our goals, to make sure that whatever images are generated is dramatically different than what was possible before. That we invent a new computing model that takes advantage of the efficiencies of rasterization, but the real, realistic simulation of light for shadows and reflections and area lights, refractions, and all of those translucencies and all of those effects that are so difficult with rasterization to combine it with compute and also artificial intelligence to make all of this work together in an operable way so that developers could create the amazing imageries that they would like to dream to do. It has to be amazing at today's applications, but it has to be utterly awesome for tomorrow's. When you buy this GPU, you're gonna enjoy it immediately, and you're gonna be able to enjoy applications that will be coming very shortly that I'll show you in just a second. And just to take a look at what's inside this chip, so the Turing SM, 16 teraflops and 16 tips, does concurrent floating point and in, in integer instructions at the same time, has a unified L1 cache, has variable rate shading. For foveated rendering, all kinds of new algorithms are possible. Motion adaptive shading, so when things are moving, you don't have to dedicate as much shading horsepower to it. For different areas that you might be able to reduce the amount of shading horsepower dedicated to it because the, the content's not changing very much. So all kinds of new algorithms are now possible so that we can conserve the shading horsepower to create and dedicate it and assign, focus that computing resource where you might need it most. The RT, RT core, 10 giga rays per second, it has, an ex, it has an accelerator that accelerates the BVH, the bounding volume hierarchy, acceleration structure. Basically, when you look into a scene, there are all these geometries. The geometries are encapsulated in these bounding volumes. These bounding volumes are created in real time. And this bounding volume inside has subparts in the geometry, and those, they have sub-bounding volumes. When an ray intersects one box, 
you can dismiss all of the other boxes because they're not going to be in the rate. That allows you to figure out as quickly as possible, test of all the rays that you're sending in, into the scene, which ray intersects with which surface and which primitive. That test is so computationally intensive, for the longest time people thought that it would never be possible to do on a GPU until now. That's why it took 10 years of research. Figuring out exactly how to create this RT core, ray tracing core, that accelerates this data structure, this acceleration structure, to figure out exactly which one of the primitives that a ray intersects, and to interoperate with a shader was a great challenge. That was the amazing invention. As a result, we were able to achieve real-time ray tracing for the very first time. The tensor core has three different precisions. FP16, well, of course, it has FP32. It has 120 teraflops, 25 teraflops of FP16, 250 tops of int 8, and 500 tops of int 4. If you need precision, use FP16, 10 times the performance of Pascal. If you need less precision, use N4, 10 times what was possible with Pascal. Incredible. The display is designed completely for HDR through and through and supports 8K displays for the very first time. Video is designed to be able to encode 8K and to do so with the highest level of quality, reducing your bit rate. So if we wanted to stream graphics or remote graphics from far away, we could do so incredibly well for the very first time. And as this MV link that combines, connects multiple GPUs so that the frame buffer is essentially additive. Giant frame buffers. If you compare it to Pascal, it looks a little bit like this. Pascal was 11.8 billion transistors, 471 millimeters squared, 24 gigabytes at 10 gigahertz. Turing is 1.6 times bigger, 19 billion transistors. It's the largest processor the world has ever made, short of just one other. And that one other is called the Volta V100 that's used to power supercomputers all over the world. Turing is 754 millimeters squared. If you ever get to see 754 millimeters squared, it's just gigantic and has the ability to drive 48 plus 48 gigabytes of frame buffer, a giant frame buffer. The largest Titan X today is 12 gigabytes. Now with Quadro RTX, we have a 96 gigabyte frame buffer. If you compare it like this, 13 teraflops is now 16 plus 16 tips. So both, instead of having to wait between floating point or integer, we can now do floating point and an integer at the same time. Instead of 50 tops of N8, we now have a tensor core that can either do 125 ter teraflops for precision in inference, or 500 ter tops of N4. And then, of course, a brand new processor called RT Core. This brand new software stack, in order to bring all of this to life, is software and algorithms and libraries and SDKs and tools. This is the first rendering architecture that supports this hybrid approach of rendering. Interoperability between rasterization and, race and ray tracing and compute and AI. It supports optics, Vulkan, and Microsoft DXR. There's a plug-in architecture for deep learning so that we could use, create models for super resolution, for example, for denoising, for example, for frame interpolation, for example. All kinds of new special effects are going to be possible because of this architecture, and it runs it on the tensor core. The tensor core is so fast, it makes it possible for us to create these really sophisticated models, deep learning models, and run it in real time. Today we're also announcing that we're going to open source a really, really fantastic piece of work called the NVIDIA MDL, Material Description Language, a high-level programming language that captures the properties, the physical properties of materials 
and its reflectance functions, its metalness and dielectric smoothness or roughness, all captured in this thing called a bidirectional reflectance scattering function. On first principles, capture the properties of materials and makes it possible for us to then interchange it between applications. We're also announcing today that we're working closely with Pixar and we're going to support the universal scene description language so that content could move in and out of tools from Maya to RenderMan to post effects. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the happiest place on earth. <laughs> I had that done just for you. <laughs> a brand new, <laughs> a brand new software stack for this new way of doing computer graphics. Computer graphics reinvented. Merging rasterization and ray tracing, compute, and AI. Well, our goal, of course, is to create amazing imagery. And this is a, a wonderful way to, to, um, uh, to inspire us, the Cornell box. It was designed so that it's easy for us to compare and determine the accuracy of a rendered image to a box to image it that was taken from a camera. This was uh, the work out of Cornell when they were, I think they were, uh, wrote the first paper that was presented here about, the, about um, mul multiple diffused uh, uh, objects uh, and lighting between them. And so that was, I forget when, how many years ago it was, but this is, a, this is an example of the Cornell box. Well, let's show you uh, what today's computer graphics looks like. So Omar. OK. So we're going to step through this very quickly, just give you a sense of the progress of computer graphics. This is traditional graphics, and this is a point light and you have different materials on it. Uh, the red is leather, the white is cement, and the green uh, ball there uh, is, is a very, very valuable uh, material, the NVIDIA logo. And um, uh, it looks like, uh, it looks like, uh, looks like uh, clear coat, uh, car paint, green car paint. And you can see that the that the, uh, the point light is casting a shadow, uh, casting shadows, and those shadows are, are um, well, they, they look rather hard, and, and it's made out, of, uh, made out of shadow maps, shadow maps. And so let's, uh, let's, show, let's go take it to another step. Okay, so we can add compute to that, and this is, we could do things like camera effects, like depth of field. Okay, let's take it another step. We could do bloom. Okay, so bloom, what, what did you, did you turn it off? You turn it on, on off. Is it on or off? Oh, okay, there it is. There's bloom, okay, another camera effect. Let's go another one. But none of these look super great. Okay, so now we're gonna turn on RTX. So this is area lights with RTX, and notice the soft shadows. The shadows are soft. There's a, you can see the umbra and the penumbra, the soft edges around the shadow. And so for the area lights, you have to figure out the light that con contributes on the, on the left hand, let's see, on, the, on, the le on your left hand um, as, it, as it lights this direction, and the light on the on the right hand goes in this direction, and also the light that comes down contributing to this area here. And so as a result, 
uh, some parts of it is well lit and some part of it is kind of blurry and nice and soft and that's the that's the feeling that you get when you see a really nicely well casted shadow. Okay, so this is area lights. Let's suppose we had more area lights. Okay, now with more area lights, you would expect each one of the area lights uh, to be able to contribute to lighting the scene. And so you could see now the penumbra and the umbra right here, nice and sharp, and this is nice and soft. You could see the light um, bleeding on top of the roof. Casting Nash shadows. So these are, this is something that you could do with ray tracing so that you could use soft, uh, you could use area lights to cast soft shadows. If you were to do this with traditional graphics, the way you would do it is to simulate that area light with a whole bunch of point lights. And those, all of those point lights would have to uh, light the environment one at a time and you would integrate that. Okay, so these are multiple lights. Let's suppose we go do something even harder. So this is reflection. Reflections are hard to do using traditional computer graphics. And the way that they do it, the way that we do it, is to create an environment map. And that environment map would now be a texture map that's looked up um, as we figure out which, uh, where, wherever the normal is, so we look it up towards the, uh, the cube map. Okay, and so now we use uh, ray tracing to create the reflections, and it looks, looks proper. And you could see that there's a line, that edge right up on the top, is actually a reflection of that, that crease up there on the wall. And that, um, on that side of it, it's white. On this side of it, you see the rest of the walls. Okay, let's take another step forward, Omer. And this is diffuse reflection. Diffuse reflection, adding, adding roughness to the ball. Okay, another one. Adding refraction. This is um, another ray traced effect that works incredibly well and, and just works nicely. However, uh, there's something looks wrong down here, Omar. Uh, does that, that doesn't look quite right. There's an effect called caustics as light accumulates. There you go. So that's caustics, another effect that's very possible to do with ray tracing. Now let's, let's uh, this is still, this is a mixture of ray tracing and rasterization. Suppose we went to path tracing. Suppose we did glo global illumination. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, all of this is just working right out of the pipeline, and this is the benefits. Okay. What is it? It's okay. They're friends. What is it? I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Okay. All right. But can I have my clicker back? This is what happens when we don't practice. You guys are seeing everything in real time. Okay, so, so uh, <laughs> this, we're a real-time computer graphics company. Everything's real-time. Nothing is pre-computed. <laughs> Nothing is done offline. No lights are baked, no light probes, no fake lights, no fake reflections. Everything's all real. Okay, so we have computer graphics, traditional graphics with rasterization. We showed you depth of field rasterization with compute. We showed you area light rasterization, ray tracing, and compute. We showed you ras uh, reflections, rasterization, ray tracing, and compute. And the compute in each case is to denoise ray tracing. Because the, bound the rays are bouncing all over the place at some point, at some point, at some point, you, you could use AI or some heuristics to figure out what are the missing dots and how should we fill it all in. Okay, that's called denoising. And it's, it allows us, using ray, in, in ray tracing, allows us to complete the frame a lot faster than we otherwise could. And there are all kinds of amazing denoising algorithms, and nothing is, 
Nothing is, is uh, more powerful than using deep learning to do that. But in some, case, com, some cases, we use compute. And so reflections, uh, diffuse reflections, refractions, caustics, and then finally, global illumination. All four engines are all running at the same time. Now, the benefit is this. This is how we started. This is traditional computer graphics, rasterization, and shading, and wonderful materials. It looks pretty fantastic. We could fake it. We can improve the looks of it with all kinds of, all kinds of, all kinds of trickery, and, and we all do that. And it makes video games look amazing. However, there's, it's so brittle. It's so brittle, and so many things you can't do. I'm going to show you some of the things you can't do. But you could turn on RTX, and it looks like this. Everything here is completely in real time. So off, on. Which one do you guys like better? Before, pass, before Turing, after Turing. Before Turing, after Turing. OK, so what we did is we put everything together into a really short clip. What you're about to see is completely in real time. All the reflections, all the, re all the refractions, all the shadows, the area lights, the GI. Everything is being done in real time, OK? Ignatius, let's run it. Amazing. You guys, you guys, you absolutely have to go to our booth and take a look at all of this in real time on a real display. The, vi the, the, the display in this room doesn't give it anywhere near justice. And I'm looking at it on my display, and it's absolutely beautiful. So you guys absolutely have to go do that. Guys, that's fantastic. Good job. For the longest time, computer real-time computer graphics has been really used for interactivity, design of CAD, um, use it for flight simulators, use it for video games. The market, the industry that relies on visualization, photorealistic re visualization is absolutely gigantic. 
However, it's never been able to use GPUs. It's never been able to have the benefit of acceleration because the requirements are photoreal. Unless you could do real time, uh, excuse me, unless you could do ray tracing and you could do global illumination with physically based materials and physically based lighting that conserves energy so that everything looks according to the way you would expect it to look and has the ability to hold very large assets because the world is large and the textures are detailed and they're really doing large, large scenes. Until you could do that, it's simply impossible to take advantage of acceleration for most of these markets. And they're all completely run on CPUs today. So whether you're, you're designing and creating these cars and making it photorealistic, light baking and video gamers, uh, the, way, the reason why the video games look so amazing, even though there are so many limitations in the way we calculate light, is because somebody, an artist, pre-computed all the lights and pre-computed the ambient occlusion and baked it into the textures. And as a result, when you see the video game, it's incredibly beautiful. However, the lights can't move. The environment can't be nearly as interactive. We've been trying to solve that problem for a very long time. Today, we still use light baking and pre-computing to do so. Architectural engineering and design. Unless it looks like it's going to look, it's really impossible to use the image. And today's architecture, they're not large brown buildings and large structural buildings. They're buildings that are basically gigantic products, beautiful, gigantic products. And they want you to feel the experience of being in it. And without understanding the effects of light and how light responds in that entire environment, it's really, really hard to convey the sensation that you would ultimately get when you're in the building. Visualization. Every catalog today is largely rendered. The reason why it's rendered is because it's more flexible, obviously, and because it's cheaper. It's cheaper than setting up all these different stages, sets and, and stages. IKEA's print catalog are all rendered, meticulously rendered on render farms, one image at a time. And even that saves some money. And you guys know, of course, whether it's full feature length animations or special effects, all rendered with large render farms. For the very first time, for the very first time, NVIDIA RTX is making it possible for us to bring accelerated workflows and acceleration to this market. It turns out there's another birthday. This is the 70th birthday of Porsche. And they created an amazing trailer. I want to share it with you. The speed of light, a universal constant, never diminishing, never ending. Seventy years of unrelenting progress. The Porsche 911 Speedster concept. The speed of light. Wow. <laughs> now just imagine, in order to create that trailer, the reflections has to look right. The materials have to be physically based. So when light strikes it, it creates the right appearance. The reflections are dynamic. It's flowing over the car. There's global illumination, soft shadows, the little tiny creases, reflection and refraction off the windshield. This image is so subtle, it's simply not possible to rasterize it. Well, as it turns out, what you saw just now, it was not a movie. It's completely in real time. Ignacio?
This is the work again of some amazing engineers and artists. Uh, we work so closely with the team at Unreal, uh, Epic, and uh, the Unreal Engine team. Uh, Kim and his team did just an amazing job, as you could, they always do, and the engineers at NVIDIA working closely together, and the Porsche designers uh, that were part of this project. They're so proud of it. I mean, this is just utterly shocking. Ignatia, what else, what else can we do? Area lights, the soft shadows across the area light. Look at that. Everything is completely real time. Global illumination. You could see some of the light just leaking right into the cabin. Wow. What else? Dynamic reflections. Can't do that with rasterization. No, look at the reflection off the windshield. Everything is all ray traced. Is Kim there? Where's Kim? Yeah. Kim, what do you think? Unbelievable. You know, I've been in computer graphics now for 27 years, and it was a dream to see real-time ray tracing come true. And I think over the next decade, we're going to see such amazing capabilities of your hard work, powering you know, interactive experiences, you know, movies and games. They're going to look the same. Photorealism, absolute photorealism is within our grasp now. It's amazing. Kim, that's just amazing work you guys did. Thank you. You know, you, know, you know, all of a sudden with this new computing, this new rendering model, the number of new algorithms that are going to come about, the new techniques for rendering is going to be reinvented again. It's just uh, the, the energy around all of our computer architects are just so high right now because there are all these, it's just a new toolbox, a new tool in the toolbox that's so powerful, you guys are going to come up with amazing things together. Yeah, and honestly, oh, it's gone. And uh, I think uh, AI for ray tracing, AI for um, computer graphics is also going to revolutionize, revolutionize the possibilities. So I think we're going to get movie quality within, the, within this new generation of cards. I think we're going to see movie quality in games as well as uh, more enterprise-like uh, applications like this. Well, we've got a lot of horsepower for you, Kim. You know, do you know how many rays we could do? That's right. <laughs> 10 giga rays. 10 giga rays. Yeah. Do you know how much AI we could do? 500 tops. 500 tops. That's right. And, and, and the shader, the shader, it's got, it's got independent floating point and energy processing. 16 flops and 16 tips. 16 tips. 16 tips. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, man. You're awesome. That's just amazing, guys. That's, isn't that beautiful? The work of Epic, they're just amazing. If you would have projected, if you would have projected, if you would have projected from DGX Station to where we would have finally expected to see this on one graphics card, we expected something along the lines of five to 10 years. Something along the lines of five to 10 years. Because of two fundamentally new technology, we were able to bring it to today. And those two technologies is exactly what, what Kim was saying earlier, ray tracing acceleration with the RT core and then deep learning with the tensor core. By combining those two technologies with what we did before, rasterization and shading and compute, all of a sudden we gave ourselves just an enormous boost and we pulled in ray tracing somewhere between five to 10 years. And everybody is surprised. Everybody is shocked. All the developers we're working with, it's just amazing that we can basically cast as many shadows and rays as we want. Reflection rays and refraction rays are much, much more expensive. But even then, we could cast a whole bunch of them. The ability to be able to do ray tracing at 10 giga rays per second is really, really quite powerful. The performance, when you compare that with what we're currently experiencing, so this is what you're looking at on top is essentially what you would get if you had DGX Station. The architecture 
the architecture that's inside DGX Station for computer graphics is essentially what you're looking at, Pascal. Okay? And with some of it is used for rasterization, some of it's used for shading, and a lot of it is used for tracing the rays. A lot of it is used for tracing the rays. There's a few technologies that when in combination in this RTX platform, when you put them together, does this. Isn't that amazing, guys? A 6x speed up in computer graphics. A 6x speed up in computer graphics. Well, the way that it's done is we, number one, accelerate the ray tracing part of it. We still have to shade it, but the, the ray tracing acceleration is just incredibly fast. The second part is by using AI, we're able to render at a slightly lower resolution, but because we train that model, off of very high quality ground truth, we're essentially going to be able to generate the final image at a much, much higher rate. And so we call it DLAA. The combination of AI and ray tracing has made it possible for us in the Unreal Engine 4 with RTRT, real time ray tracing, running on top of Microsoft's DXR API. This is basically today's most popular platform. We're able to take computer graphics and improve it by a factor of six. Turing is six times Pascal. I mean, it's just incredible. Here, I love looking at that. You know, I, I just, the engineers do all the hard work and I just look at it like this. <laughs> incredible. You guys, great job. One of the most important things you'll see, and Kim was alluding to it, is that we're going to use AI in so many different parts of our graphics pipeline. One of them is anti-aliasing. As I was mentioning earlier, we use a temporally stable, not a temporarily stable, a temporally stable convolutional autoencoder. We teach this autoencoder from ground truth that was generated from 64 samples, jittered samples of a rendering. Imagine, it's basically, you render the same image 64 times, we, gener we jitter the samples, and then we use a very high quality filter, and we combine it all together into one, and it becomes one frame of a ground truth. We create a whole bunch of those, and we teach this neural network how to take an image and generate that. We teach an, auto, an AI network, after we're done training it, it will, you'll give it an image and it will automatically generate a much higher quality image. As a result, we could start with a lower resolution image and the result is a higher quality than a higher resolution image. Really, really quite amazing. The power of deep learning. High quality motion image generation. We call it the NVIDIA DLAA, and that's what you saw in action. As a result, the combination of ray tracing, faster shading, DLAA because of the tensor core, these three processors working together, Turing was able to accelerate the rendering time by a factor of six. Architectural design needs photorealistic images. These scenes to an architect has to be photoreal so that they could convey the, sens the sensation of the environment to their clients. To do this is incredibly challenging. And the reason for that is because in most of these rooms, light is largely indirect. It comes in, it bounces around, and it picks up the nuances of the surface it strikes. And it bounces around until a full scene, what you experience to be a really natural environment. The light is indirect, materials are physically, obviously physical, and so they have different reflectance properties, and that gives you the sensation of a, of a space.
And so we're going to do that with computer graphics. Guys? So this is the Rosewood in Bangkok. And before, I sh before we show you, before we show you, this is really amazing. So we created this, this visualizer, this viewer. And it's connected to the Revit, in this case, and um, SolidWorks. Between SolidWorks and Revit, you could modify and edit right there in the tool, and it will show up instantly in the viewer. And the viewer is powered by RTX. Okay? And so, so uh, Sean is going to be able to modify the building. This is the Rosewood in Bangkok. He'll be able to modify the building. He'll be able to place objects inside this building. And it'll just show up in this viewer in real time. And then it's rendered on RTX. Sean, go ahead and give it a try. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we can see we have Revit open there. Uh, we're looking at the lobby scene, and at this time of the day, there's just not enough natural light coming in. So wh why don't we open up some of the skylights, and, and we can see how that affects the, the illumination. Now, obviously, you can't fake this. Obviously, this isn't baked into the textures, and the reason for that is because you just place the lights. And you can modify the lights. You could change the time of day and get a sense of the feeling of this room. Look at that. Wow. Marble looks like marble that whatever that horse thing is made out of looks like whatever that horse thing is made out of. You know? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it looks right. If we go a little deeper into the scene, we can see you know, this kind of uh, lobby feature here by the elevators. Uh, and it's kind of a great opportunity. Hallways to are obviously artwork. super hard, right, Sean? So we can import an object here from SOLIDWORKS and simply see how changing the materials in SOLIDWORKS is actually changes the look and feel of the space. This is Jeff Koontz's dog, shiny dog. We love shiny dogs. Wow. Wow. You guys see what's happening? I mean, this is just amazing. This is like having a wormhole between SolidWorks, Revit, and this viewer. It's just incredible. OK, is anything else? Shiny dog? That's what we wanted to show for now. That's beautiful. Look, 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 at, the, look at the reflection of the sun right back there. It's just incredible, the bloom there. OK, ladies and gentlemen, using RTX for architectural engineering and design. We worked with Autodesk's Arnold team, and um, and they've been working. They've been working with RTX, and they're just completely blown away. Uh, in no time ever have have it been po has it been possible to render final film, final film production on a GPU. And the reason for that is because it just it wasn't fast enough. It wasn't fast enough, and and uh, it didn't have large enough frame buffer to be able to hold all of the assets. It wasn't fast enough because so much of the time is spent ray tracing. And now with global illumination, billions and billions of rays are being cast. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to um, uh, uh, trace the, the shadow rays, but you've got to trace all of the reflection rays and all the refraction rays. And there's just so many bounces all over the place to simulate global illumination. As a result, GPUs were simply not possible to render these scenes. Well, finally, with RTX, we've been able to do so. What I'm about to show you are several images of a shot. Now, if I showed you the shot, it would just look like a movie sequence. And so I'm showing you several images of a shot, and every one of these shots, every one of these frames were rendered, every one of these frames were rendered on the Quadro RTX. Final film quality for the very first time. <laughs> it's 
This is what you, motion blur and all. This is what you get. This is what you get when you have the world's first ray tracing GPU with 48 gigabytes each. And if you connect the two of them together with this incredible technology that I'm wearing called MV Link, you get 96 gigabytes of frame buffer. And that captures about as large scenes as most do. And so for the very first time, we're able to ray trace final film production quality assets. Well, we created an, a server called the RTX server. And it's designed for production rendering with full global elimination. And this production server is really quite amazing. This one server with eight GPUs, this one server with eight GPUs will allow you to speed up your final film rendering. And it's designed to be remoted. It sits in a data center. It could be your render farm. It could also be your workstation. It could be your RenderMan workstation. It could be your Maya workstation. It could be your Nuke workstation. Every single application in the DCC universe is compatible with the software layer that we created called Quadro Infinity. You can put this in your data center, it becomes your workstation, and when you, whenever you're not using it as a workstation, it's your render server. The rendering time goes down from hours to minutes, from hours to minutes. And so let's take a look at what that means. Suppose, you know, most of these data centers, as you know, most of these data centers, these render farms, um, most production, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, unusual for production costs to be 100 plus million dollars. And 20% of that, $20 million of it, is very typically assigned to the render farm. I'm showing you here just $2 million, one-tenth of a render farm. This is not quite a farm. This is probably just a garden. OK? So this is a render garden. Now, now, now <laughs> no, no, no feature production could, could, do, could do with such a small server farm. But I'm just going to show you this little part for, for illustration purposes. 240 dual core, dual CPU, 12 core Skylakes, 144,000 watts, $2 million. That's what you're looking at. If we wanted to have the same throughput on the RTX server, this is what it looks like. You guys ready? Okay. This is uh, before. This is after. This is before. So, so this is this. You can't even call this a garden. This is this is your just your planner box. Okay, Every, this is your personal render farm. And it's just a fraction of the cost. It only costs about one-fourth as much. It takes one-tenth the space, and it takes one-tenth the power. Each megabyte, each megawatt of power, each megawatt of power is a million dollars a year. Each mega, megawatt of power is a million dollars per year. And so most data centers have 10, 20 megawatts, and so you could imagine the cost as it goes forward. Saving money is one reason, but as, as, as we know from Blinn's Law, whatever the budget is, the DP is going to want to use that full budget to maximize their creativity. And so let's take another shot at this. Suppose you had a constant budget of $500,000. You had a $500,000, OK? And so you had one server rack here for $500,000, another one for $500,000. You get four times the performance. Now, the, re the, the reason why it's so amazing is because each one of those DGXs allows you to create a three-second shot. Most shots are about, you know, call it two to three seconds, about 75 to 125 frames. Those shots now take one hour. Instead of a shot taking five hours or six hours, it now just takes one hour. You could do a shot right before you go to bed, uh, go, to, go to lunch. You could do six, seven shots per day. So the number of iterations is just really quite remarkable. It's going to completely change how people do film. The, the excitement from the DCC, the ISVs, have just been incredible. Adobe Dimension has, uh, is working on integrating RTX. 
Autodesk Arnold, Pixar Renderman, Chaos V-Ray, Weta, all integrating RTX, all of the DCC tools, CATIA, Siemens NX, NSX, SolidWorks, integrating RTX. The number of software developers that have come out to embrace this platform is like nothing I've ever seen. And the reason for that is this. Everybody is under the constraint to deliver photorealistic images. Global illumination is now the bar. And we need to do global illumination in a physically, physically based way that allows us to generate photorealistic images. The Quadro RTX starts at $2,300. RTX 5000, all of that capability, accelerating rendering for final film, the ability to generate photorealistic images for architectural engineering and construction, DCC, and generating photoreal images, not to mention real-time ray tracing for video games and interactive content. RTX 5000, 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes with a NV link, starts out at $2,300. Six giga rays per second. The 6,000 is 24 gigabytes and 48 gigabytes if you use NV link, has 10 giga rays per second, $6,300. And then finally, the monster, RTX 8000. 48 gigabyte frame buffer, it's just gigantic. It's like four times the size of a high-end quadro board today for just $10,000. It's a steal. The important thing to remember is this. The more you buy, the more you save. The more you buy, the more you save. Every single world-class global system maker has jumped onto RTX. You're gonna have workstations, amazing new workstations. You're gonna have servers of all different sizes. One GPU, two GPU, four GPU, eight GPUs. They're gonna come in all different sizes and shapes. Quadro RTX is gonna be available all over the world. So this is it. NVIDIA Turing, graphics reinvented. There's no question in my mind, this is the single greatest leap that we have ever made in one generation. This is the most important GP we've created since NVIDIA CUDA. Turing delivers six times the performance of real-time ray tracing over Pascal, the highest performance GPU in the world today. The Quadro RTX 8000, 6000, 5000, the world's first ray tracing GPU, supporting a complicated stack that has been integrated into ISVs all over the world. The Quadro RTX systems allows you to do seven shots in one day. Seven shots in one day. Who doesn't want seven shots in a day? And then for the very first time, for the very first time, after all these years, we've been able to build something that the visualization industry, the $250 billion visual effects industry, for the very first time, we can enable them to be accelerated so that we can change their workflow. So we enable them to do more with the same budget. What do you guys think? <laughs> well, we have one more surprise for you. The guys have been working really, really hard on this. What you're about to see, what you're about to see is completely in real time. You're gonna see reflections. You're gonna see inner reflections. You're gonna see wonderful shadows from area lights. You're gonna see ambient occlusion. You're gonna see the effects of global illumination. Everything is gonna be dynamic. You're gonna see physically 
based materials so the materials look real. You're going to see everything, and it's going to be in real time. Everything is in real time running on a Turing. This is what the new Turing can do. Before I say goodbye, I want to thank all of you for coming to our launch. We're so excited about the Turing launch. I appreciate the support of literally every single developer in the DCC industry. The embrace that you have given us for NVIDIA RTX is nothing short of astounding. And the reason for that is I believe you all see, for the very first time, we could take a giant leap and redefine what computer graphics is. Computer graphics will never look the same again. It'll never look the same again. And the support has been phenomenal. So I want to thank all of you for that. I also want to thank all of the audience who are the pioneers of this industry. Because of the work that you have done, it has allowed us to stand on your shoulders to create what you see today. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you. Thanks for coming to our launch. The team is going to show you something that is utterly unbelievable. <laughs>